Good evening, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to this prayer at the close of the day. It is Wednesday, for first day of fall, first full day of fall, year of our Lord, 2022, September 21st. If I didn't say that already, nice to have you joining me this evening for this prayer at the close of the day. Church today commemorates St. Matthew, the apostle and evangelist. He's one of the two apostles that recorded a record of our Lord's life, John being the other one. Mark probably saw a lot of the episodes uh, of our Lord's life. Luke, however, did not. Luke was uh, would have learned it from um, Peter, Mark, uh, and maybe some of the other apostles as he had opportunity. But he uh, and Mary too is a source uh, of Luke. But anyway, today we commemorate it's the feast of Saint Matthew, so we commemorate Saint Matthew today. So I'll sing, and we're going to continue our reading from Timothy, uh, according to the daily lectionary. But just it's nice to remember those saints that have come before us with all their foibles, with all their um, uh, humanity, uh, that the same humanity that we have, and to see how our Lord transformed them and used them as he's doing with us until the day we die. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last, amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. And as I mentioned a moment ago, we continue with a daily lectionary reading from St. Paul's first epistle, his first letter to Timothy. One, This is one of the pastoral epistles. So we'll read chapter 4 in its entirety. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons, through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God in prayer. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, for to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth. But set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching, do not neglect the gift that you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them, so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this. For so, for so by doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. And this is the word of the Lord. It's a wonderful section. We still have a little ways to go in this letter to this young pastor, Timothy. But he, you know, Paul reminds us, and this is all a good thing for all pastors to, to remember, actually for all of us to remember in the church, people leave the faith. Uh, I, you know, we're, we're trained in seminary, not really trained. I, seminary doesn't really train you, it forms you. Uh, yeah, it's training and you're, you do a lot of studying, but it forms you. And you're not the same person when you go into seminary as when you come out. You're certainly not the same person if you've been ordained for a while. I mean, I am who I am. I have my same sort of weird sense of humor for, the few, for those of you who spend any time around me, and I think weird things are funny. And uh, uh, you know that you know that's. Uh, that, I mean, I certainly have behaviors that I don't like about myself, and I try to change. It's loving myself and, and loving my neighbor in a God-pleasing way. But you're not the same person, you know, and neither are you, you know. And we hear that, and there is, you know, God meets you where you are in the gospel, and then goes to work on you. You know, he, he doesn't give us permission to sort of sit there and do nothing, but we become people. And look back, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, 
look back on your life and think, you know, how you think about things now and how you did 10 years ago, even if you've been a Christian for 50 years or 60 years, you're going to, you know, God is constantly going to work on you. Uh, so interesting. Um, you know, people do leave the faith. However, sometimes people that are very close to us, uh, and sometimes they leave the faith to other things that are called the faith, you know, uh, and I, and that, that it breaks our hearts, doesn't it? It breaks your, my heart breaks your heart. And I, I didn't finish that thought a moment ago that, you know, when we're trained, we're, we're trained, you know, you can't take this personally because, you know, they're, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting God's teaching and stuff like that. And that's, that's true. But you still take it personally. And it for you, know, you look in the mirror, you think, you know, you know, uh, you know, what am I doing wrong as a pastor? And sometimes you're surrounded by um, churches, usually of other confessions that appear very successful. They have very different theologies. Sometimes that's what leads to their success. And I don't want to go down that rabbit trail, but um, it is interesting to me and it is heartbreaking to me when people leave our confession and the gift of baptism and go to a church where they have to be rebaptized, uh, you know, as an adult, because uh, that church isn't that, and that should tell you something or you know, the, the sacrament is merely uh, symbolic. So, and, that, and notice, uh, as Paul writes here, he's talking about really kind of those kinds of things. I mean, he, you know, he's not talking about open sin like drunkenness and stuff. He does that in other places, you know, you know, drunkards and things like that. They will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Uh, but here he's talking about, you know, these people who come and add things to the faith, who... who transform the gift of grace into something you have to earn. And it, it's interesting when I read other churches doctrine that I see things like uh, phrases like merited grace. You know, I, I don't, I don't know what that is. Um, that's a wage that's payday. Uh, it's not grace uh, and it's certainly not free uh, if it's merited. So, um, you know, he gives this warning to Timothy and then, you know, he keeps reminding about, you know, clinging to the words, clinging to the doctrine. Remember, doctrine is nothing but scripture. All right. And, and, and this is something we have to face. And if you, you know, were listening to my sermon on Sunday and I was talking actually about it, it was it came up in the Sunday lectionary a reading from this same letter uh, from Timothy. And um, I'm surprised I didn't get some phone calls on that. I'm not surprised because I think people you know, understand this is what our church teaches. But there are sometimes uncomfortable things for us to hear. And I, I made that comment. I said, I kind of, I, I, I have, I have real disagreements with, um, doing sermon series and jumping, jumping out of the lectionary. Uh, I mean, Lent and Advent are excluded because those Wednesday night services are just sort of standalone services. And often we have a theme that carries us through those, but it's pointing us to the daily lectionary uh, and certainly placing us, you know, still in the church here. Uh, I can't remember what we're going to do. We're going to do something for Advent. Um, I already have the theme picked out, but by golly, I can't remember what it is now. Anyway, you know, but the, the problem is, is like when I pick a sermon series, it's going to be on something that, um, I think we, I, I think we need, you know, and I, instead of letting God work through his word in this ancient lectionary, these lectionaries are, are ancient, their flow, Easter, Christmas, Easter, Christmas, the incarnation and the resurrection, and in particular the resurrection, it's the, it's the pole, uh, you know, the, the crucifixion and resurrection of the, 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 the pole upon which, um, around which we orbit. And of course, the, the incarnation is Christmas is caught up in that. But you sometimes have to deal with these very difficult texts, you know, um, and, and that keeps, I, I have to, you know, since I'm doing the lectionary, I have to do it. I have to preach them and I have to preach them, you know, because what I, I know if, if I'm sitting there reading this text and going, whoa, you know, so the two texts that we had that were very, very, not, especially the first one isn't difficult, but it just makes us uncomfortable in our culture. Not me personally, probably not you either, but it makes our culture uncomfortable. It's about the role of women in the church. And scripture is very clear on that. And the other one was, you know, this parable that Christ gives. And you have to know the whole context. And hopefully I unpack that with some success during the sermon. But, you know, the the uh, the parable where it's called the parable of the unjust steward. Christ didn't know those, that's just a heading that the editors or the uh, translators put on, on on it. But it's that strange thing where the guy's going to lose his job, the steward, you know, the the worker, and the you know because the master finds out he's not very good at what he does. And uh, there's a sermon right there. And and so he goes and calls the, the people that owe the master money. Says change your bills, and then he's commended for that. By the master, and then Jesus turns and says, "You know, so you make 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 you know friends by unrighteous mammon." 
And it's like, what the, you know, what, 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 what's going on? <laughs> you know, and you know, if I'm sitting there and thinking about it, you know, so are the people sitting through you. So the lectionary, my devotion to that word of God that I necessarily didn't pick. In fact, I never picked them. You know, it's the lectionary. Uh, that and I have the the you know the three readings the Old Testament the Epistle New Testament I suppose I can pick from one of those uh, I, but I always go with the Gospel and draw from the other two you know because that's the words of our Lord and you know but it, it is it's good for me because then I I have to grapple with those difficult texts and I learn you know and then I, I I get excited about it when I when things sort of you know begin to get clearer in my mind and I'm always learning about this and then and then I so then I you know sort of can't wait to get in the pulpit on Sunday and, and you know here this is this is, this is like cool, isn't it? You know, that, that, it, that, that was a cool text. And then why God does, and why God establishes the rule that he does, the rules that he does and the things he does all out of love for us. Anyway, this is what Paul is saying here, you know, it's the word, doctrine. You know, even if it makes you uncomfortable, you know, I teach it, I submit to it, you hear it, you submit to it, you know, with mixed success, but the goal is always to submit to it. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, he goes to, you know, we toil and strive in these things because our hope is set on the living God. You know, we have a hope that's otherworldly. Uh, you know, you think about Matthew, you know, who's a tax collector, probably living a pretty comfy life, uh, you know, robbing his neighbors, um, and yet is called to be an apostle. And we don't really know what, what happened to him other than, other than, other than he writes the, uh, he probably wrote it in Hebrew. That's, that's sort of the standard, um, the standard thinking. He probably wrote the uh, the gospel record that bears his name, the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, uh, in Hebrew, and then it was translated in Greek, although there is some debate on that, but that is the most Hebrew of texts, uh, and, and it does, you know, it, it, it just like uh, oh, Mark and uh, uh, John in particular borrows language from Genesis, and it's seen as a completion to the Old Testament, you know, now the Old Testament, all the prophecies are fulfilled in Christ, you know, which is really a powerful message in Matthew. Um, anyway, uh, we commemorate in this day, but you think about how his life changed. And he gives us this word, this word of Christ, along with Mark and Luke uh, that are given to us and John. And yeah, they have their differences and people stumble over those things. But when you take, you shouldn't stumble over those things. But when you take a step back, you have these four witnesses, two of them eyewitnesses. And it's kind of cool that the other two aren't. Well, like I said, Mark probably was, uh, but Luke wasn't because you're hearing that the story that Luke is hearing is the same story that Matthew is telling, the same story that Mark is telling, and the same story that John is telling. John focuses on very uh, narrow and different aspects of our Lord's earth, but it's still, you take a step back, it's not like, well, there's the Jesus of Matthew, the Jesus of Luke, the Jesus of John, there's the one Christ, and it's beautiful. You know, so we thank God for those who have gone before us with their faults and their foibles, and we see how God went to work on them and led them in a way they never thought they were going to go, going to go and strengthen them, forgave them in their failures, you know, and there were many, and we have many recorded for us, just like he does with you. you know, so um, uh, the final thing I want to say about this section that we're reading, you know, first we hear, you know, command and teach these things. Uh, you know, I have a duty, and that is not to be nice. You're probably thinking, yeah, you're doing well at that. And, I, and to, let me let me pause on that too, because I was just talking about some of that today, about about that today. Uh, I didn't have a class today that I taught. That must have been in some other context. I have a lot of conversations with people, so it gets a little. By the end of the day, it's a little like I can't remember who I talked to where. And this wasn't you know confession or anything. Like that. It was just just a very pleasant conversation. It was a nice thing. But you, know, you think about what my job is, my vocation, my calling. And I think an American Christianity, this is just my opinion, just my, my observation, I've been doing this for a couple of decades now, close to a couple of decades. And, you know, I think people think, above all, the pastor's job is to be nice. And they're kind of surprised when I'm not. And I think that, that was the conversation I was having today. It's like, uh, I, there have been times, you know, I, I get backed, and it's not backed into a corner, that's not the right thing. But, so let's say somebody brings up something at Bible study. And we were talking about in this conversation about some of the things that, that um, I, I talked about on Sunday in a very good way. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, about like in Bible study when sometimes these controversial or at least would at least seem controversial topics come up. And people dig in their heels and they don't want to submit to what the Word of God says. Now, this is not something, and people know me well enough, there's something that it's like, wow, this is, 
you know, this is something the church is arguing about this, a, a particular meaning of this parable or passage. I'm, I'm happy to say that in front of people. You know, I'm happy to say, well, I want you to know that there, you're going to read a couple of commentaries and somebody might have this nuance. I mean, he's still coming out with the same Christ, but it's just like exactly what's being said there. Um, not some off the wall thing, uh, which is kind of a postmodern thing that does happen. But anyway, you know, sometimes people at Bible study just dig their heels in and will not listen to what I'm saying as the pastor. You know, uh, and, and showing them from the Word of God and saying, well, this is, and showing them the connections with the Old Testament or vice versa. And, you know, you kind of got to get loud. Well, I don't, I do get loud because it, you know, it's like, I'm telling you, I'm showing you. I mean, it doesn't happen very often, but, you know, but, but there you see, hopefully, you know, and it probably looks like I'm being, a, a, you know, snarky or, or mean or not, not let's say not nice. Because I'm not doing this to be mean. I'm doing this because I love those people and I love everybody. I have to, you know, when somebody makes a public statement in a public forum, like a Bible study or something else, and I think it needs correction, I don't have a choice. I have to correct it. I can't let the 30 or 40 other people go home, you know, uh, if our Bible studies are that big, you know, uh, to say, I like, can't let them to go home and say, you know, wondering, like, well, 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 who's right there? And you notice that in our church, we do not have Bible studies where we sit around and say, well, what does this mean to you? What does this mean to you? What does this mean to you? Because that's not right. Um, if we don't know what it means, then we don't say anything. We do the work and we study. And if we do know what it means, then we say it. And there isn't 20 different meanings. I mean, there's nuances and sometimes, you know, uh, double entendres and things like that. Um, but we can pick those things up by context and things like that. So anyway, you know, my job, Paul is talking about that here is to be faithful to the Word of God and my call. You know, um, and one thing you see when we're ordained, and our church still does this, and I hope we never make it go away. Um, other churches, you know, people, other confessions, you know, uh, you know, and this is, a, this is uh, why this began to happen is way outside the context of this nightly devotional. But ask me about it sometime. Maybe I'll do a Bible study on it down the road. But, you know, where people could wake up one morning and say, I want to be a pastor. They tell a few good jokes, can speak well. And boom, they're in. Doesn't matter who they are. Doesn't matter their education. And they, and they say, well, the Spirit led me. Okay, well, what Spirit? You know, what's your proof in that? You know, we can all say that to some extent. Um, but I want to know what Spirit. We hear that, that there are spirits at work that aren't godly. There are demonic spirits out there that want to lead people from the faith by looking very godly. Uh, you have to be on your guard for that. So, one of the things that you see happening in our church when I'm ordained, when any pastor is ordained, and uh, I, I, you know, uh, there's some, there, our church doesn't demand this, but I think it's a very good practice that you get ordained where you are called. I mean, some guys like to get ordained in their home congregation, and um, I've been to a number of those. Uh, I was ordained where I was called, because that's where God called me. All right? And those people you know, who I was now called to be a pastor. And I'm, you know, kind of like fresh off the, off the street. The ink's still, still wet on the diploma. Um, but they saw two things. One, they were there to witness it, and they gave their amen to that. They, they said amen to that process of the call. All right, but then they saw the brothers of the, you know, they're called elders here, um, the brothers of the ministry, the, 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 the ministerium, giving their amen by placing their hands on my head. So you had the lay people saying, yes, our guy. You had the church, uh, the, the pastor saying, yes, he is certified. And the, you know, scripture doesn't use that word, but he is one of us. He is a called and ordained. And that's the, you know, um, you know, that is, uh, uh, you know, that, that's why we do that. Um, there's probably some other things I want to say about that, but, but it's already 918. Um, but that ordination is a very important thing because you have both the people and, and that means we don't stand alone as pastors either, because you have the church, the pastors come, the other, the fellow brothers um, say, he is one of us. And that, that's kind of their way, which they're placing their hands on their head. And there's language like that in the ordination, right, uh, you know, that the congregation says. But it's sort of, it's kind of a nice visual to say, you know, listen to this guy. When he's, you know, doing his vocation as a pastor, you know, not sitting around telling jokes and, and, uh, and you know, just relaxing with you. Uh, but if you're asking me theological questions and, uh, you know, I'm going to, even if I am relaxing with you, you're going to get the answer. You're going to get the pastoral answer. I'm not, we're not a pastor in that way. But when I'm in the pulpit or teaching or even doing stuff like this, you know, this is what pastors do. And, and the, the expectation is when the church comes together, it's like, yeah, this is your pastor. And what he says, you need to listen to. Now that leads us to a conundrum. It's like, well, what if your pastor isn't being faithful? Okay, now I haven't run into that. And hopefully that's never me. 
and I expect people to call me out on that. You know, if there's things I misspeak, please call me out on that, and I'm, you know, I, I'm sure I do that. Uh, uh, but if I'm openly pushing false doctrine, you need to call me out on it. You know, and I, I mean, meaning openly, like you know that hey, this isn't. He's not telling us what I learned as a kid. You know, he's denying whatever. You know, uh, the virgin birth. You know, all these things that are sort of. Uh, 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 the culture around us doesn't want to swallow, you know, that, you know, uh, uh, because they, like the virgin birth is one of them, there are many others. You know, if I get the flood, you know, things like that. So, oh, you're nuts if you think something like that. I mean, I think there happens to be evidence all around us. Anyway, uh, you know, Paul's final admonishment in this chapter to Timothy, and it's related to all of us, is to keep a close watch on yourself and your teaching, you know, and that's be faithful to your call. And that's really all of us. When I assist churches in a vacancy, one of the things I remind them, I'm a circuit visitor, and this is really a circuit visitor's job, but I remind them, it's like, you know, you're looking for a pastor who's not going to do what you want him to do. Mm -mm. You want a pastor that's going to be faithful. And you want a pastor that is going to look you in the eye. It might be painful for you. You want a pastor that's going to look you in the eye and say, knock it off. You know, and you want a pastor that's going to look you in the eye and say, in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sin, all of them. You know, that's the job. It's glorious. It's hard. It's stressful. It breaks your heart at times. A lot of sleepless nights, like any other adult job. Uh, but, uh, you know, nice words from Paul tonight about this office that, by God's grace, I've been called uh, into. All right, let's now confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father, Almighty Maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, now you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people, the light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we pray for marriage and for our families, that we would live together as husbands and wives, parents and children in the ordered harmony that you have established according to your word, knowing that in those things are a blessing. Heavenly Father, we pray, as always, for parents who must raise their children alone. We ask you to strengthen them in that task, to keep them from falling into loneliness and despair, and, as always, to be with us, their brothers and sisters, that we, as we are able, may provide, help them, help them provide for their needs. And may we, as your people, be a blessing to our communities and neighborhoods, going forth with the salt and the light, which is Christ our Lord. Heavenly Father, as always, we pray for those who are crying out to you for healing for our brothers and sisters in Christ, Dennis and Dave, Sandy, Dawn, Donna, Vicki, for my brothers in office, Mike and Dale, for dear friends of our congregation, Ashley, Heather, Joan, Dave, Katie, Anita, Bert, Rowie, Joe, Jason, Dee, Marge, Dylan, Josiah, and Jeff. Heavenly Father, hear our prayers on their behalf and heal them. Heavenly Father, be with those who care for them, that they might be your instruments for their Healing, and be with the families as they care for their loved ones, that they might not um, fall into grumbling and, uh, and uh, despondency because of the often difficult task of caring for people they love. But may it be a blessing, and may they enjoy whatever time that you give us um, with uh, those um, who, are, who are ill. Heavenly Father, all these things we ask in the precious name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Visit our dwellings, O Lord, and in your great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. 
Put your hands, I command myself, my body, soul, all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. And tonight, since we are commemorating the great apostle and evangelist, one of the great saints who have gone before us, Matthew, let's sing Behold a Host Arrayed in White, the great Norwegian hymn, hymn 676. Behold a host arrayed in white, like thousand snow-clad mountains bright. With palms they stand, who is this band, before the throne of light? These are the saints of glorious fame, who from the great affliction came, and in the flood of Jesus' blood are cleansed from guilt and shame. They now serve God both day and night, they sing their songs in endless light, their anthems ring, as they all sing with angels shining bright. Yeah, stanza one of three of that beautiful hymn. And what beautiful words it, it, uh, it confesses as we sing it. So um, again, that's Behold a Host of Raiden White, hymn 676. With that, my brothers and sisters, I bid you a, ble a pleasant evening and a blessed rest. And by God's grace, we'll see you tomorrow night. Good night.